finding a way to put yourself in the room is half the battle. Mm. And, you know, in time, uh, especially on that project, I was able to move from a BTS guy to first unit DP of the project over the course of two years. What's going on, everybody? It is Joey Nakotra here, back with another episode of the Rough Cut Club with my man Shane Wright. Samuel, what's going on, brother? Man, good to be back, ready to rock and roll on this one. I'm excited. I'm excited too, man. I think we got a fun topic today that uh, hopefully will be interesting for our listeners. Do you uh, really? You're taking lead on this one, though. You got to tee it up for me. That's why I'm excited. I feel like I'm I'm the host. Well, welcome to the driver's seat, my friend. This is Shane Wright, Samuel, your host of. The Rough Cut Club. He had to check the the TV because he forgot I, the name of the I podcast. That's, for a that's why I'm not the host. It's okay. <laughs> hey, but before we get started, yeah, man. Uh, man, tell me, what is one thing you've learned this week? Mm. This week? I'm trying to remember everything that I did this week. Yeah, there's a lot. Well, I'll, you know what? I'll go. I'll okay. go first. Okay. Um, I saw this on TikTok. It okay. blew my mind. Okay. Uh, everybody needs to participate in this in the studio, okay? Here's what we're going to do. You start laughing, fake laughing, and we're going to do this for 10 seconds, and that fake laugh should turn into a real laugh, and it goes like this, okay? And you're going to count with your fingers, and this is something you can do at home. You go, ha, ha, do it with me, do it with me. I don't do it think with me. I feel on. comfortable <laughs> doing <laughs> this. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't. Uh, kind of a little fast. <laughs> you just got endorphins. You got endorphins. Okay. I, and so it's a it's a technique you can do. And this TikTok girl, if we find the video, we'll tag her. But you can literally give yourself endorphins when you're feeling down. That's what I learned. I actually think I saw that video. And though I feel a little bit too cool for school to actually try it myself, I do believe that it is a real thing and that it works and that it is a pick-me-up. I will tell you this. Before we keep going with the endorphin uh, climbing thing, my car stole itself this week by – we had a huge ice storm, and I woke up, and my car had slid down my driveway and was in the middle of our street. And I learned that when it is icy outside that you can't park on even the mildest of hills. Yeah, we got to put that picture up. Uh, and for people just listening on the audio yeah. version, click the links. Maybe you can see the uh, picture of his car that he sent me and said, yeah, woke up like this and his car sitting Literally, in the middle of the street. I woke up and screamed. It was terrifying. Yeah. So don't park on an icy road um, yeah. during a snowstorm. And if you're feeling down. Laugh okay. for 10 seconds awkwardly. And then count to 10, count to laughing, 10. ha, Hey, ha, but ha. it makes so much sense in the movie, you know, The Joker. That's what The I Joker was doing. I the movie. Oh, I know. Get out of here. Okay, well, we better get started. Anyway, so yeah. we're here today to find out, and I think this is so valuable to uh, new filmmakers and, man, people like me that's been around for 12 plus years in, in yeah. filmmaking. Uh, you had the opportunity to DP your first feature film. Uh, was that just last year? Uh, two years ago now. Two, God, wow, time flies. So I want to, you know, I want to dive into that and find out some of the uh, things you learned on that set, what that experience was like, and even how you got to that position. So I guess to kick it off, yeah. uh, tell us, uh, first off, how did you get that opportunity? What was the project? Okay. Yeah. And then how did you get on that project? Yeah. So the project, uh, the feature film is called Washington's Armor, and it's essentially about the young life of George Washington. Uh, when I talk to other people about it, I tell them to think of uh, the Braveheart, uh, the Patriot, um, you know, something along those lines where you have some Native Americans, um, some old English people and red coats and all that good stuff. And, you know, I don't even know all the technical terms for, for, for the war and the history of it, but I shot the movie and it looks cool. But I like the, uh, the old English people, old English people. Yeah. Back in the 1700s, 1776, so we signed yeah. the declaration. Anyway, um, I think, <laughs> um, all that being said, uh, it was a really cool period piece. Um, on the young life of George and got to do some battle scenes and, and stuff and do some really cool sequences. Um, what was really cool about this project is there was actually three 
DPs on the project, and I was the third one. And so I was originally on set day one uh, as a behind-the-scenes videographer, and this was four, at least four years ago, um, because then we had COVID happen, which stopped production, and it was this whole mess. Um, and there wound up being two DPs prior to me, and so I came in, and half of the film had already been shot, and I was picking it up um, at halftime and trying to get the ball, you know, to the end zone essentially, um, you know, through the through the last half. Uh, and so there's a lot of challenges with that just coming in and not being able to have your own, you know, vision from day one. Uh, you're you're really focused on matching consistency and what serves the project best, even if it's not essentially how I would do it you know, on my own coming from day one, trying to give the project the most unity as possible. That was that was pretty tough. Um, but it was cool to start as a behind the scenes videographer. Uh, as, you know, time went on, they really liked the BTS work. I got an opportunity to second unit B cam operate, uh, which kind of like halfway led into being a second unit DP. Uh, which led into becoming the first unit DP of the rest of the project. Dude, what an incredible story. And I think that's like, you know, if you go back to one of our prior podcasts, it's just like put in the sweat equity, you yeah. know, put in the work yeah. and uh, strap in, even if it's, you know, you're always working towards the position you want to be, right. you know, and you just climbed that ladder over the, the last four yeah. years by being present and, and showing the work, and, which and is... Awesome. That's part of it. Like just being on set, like, and we've, we've talked about before, um, you know, just finding a way to put yourself in the room is half the battle. Mm. And, you know, in time, uh, especially on that project, I was able to move from a BTS guy to a cam op to a halfway second unit DP to first unit DP of the project um, over the course of two years. And so um, it was it was a really cool story, like looking back on like my first film and that being like the climb from the bottom, not even helping the film, but being on set to being the guy leading the set by the end of it. So insane, insane journey. Yeah. OK, so anticipation yep. is killing me and okay. it would probably be killing you when you're preparing for this. Right. Yep. This is a big task. Yeah. So. What did you do to prepare for this? I mean, like you're like, hey, I'm gonna be the the DP of this feature film. What's your first steps, man? What do you what do yeah. you do? Well, that was tough. So uh, you know, at first, you know, you got to get the script. You got to dive into the script. And when I get a uh, film script, whether it's a short film, whether it's a commercial film, and especially on a feature film, I like to do a clean read on it, right? So I, I like to go through, read it wrap my head around the story before thinking about what I'm going to do with the camera. Uh, I like to just gain an understanding of the story that I'm trying to tell. After that, um, I like to do a meeting with the director uh, to really wrap my mind around what their vision is for the project. And so before I go to work on thinking of shots and, um, you know, gear and execution, uh, I got to have a clear one-on-one -on -one understanding of the director's vision for the project so that I know how to best bring that to life and add value to that as well. And, and, and hopefully us working together makes it the best project that it can be. Man, that is such a great takeaway because I, I think any director out there listening to this is like, I'm going to hire this Joey Nicotri guy because I'll tell you, you know, on a film set, there's so many different of opinions, right? And there yeah. is a hierarchy, and and you should understand that it's the director's vision, and the DP makes it happen and makes it beautiful, right? And right. better. Um, but just saying that, you, I've seen that on set where DPs will start owning the the project mm -hmm. and taking away the the power of the creative instead of yeah. kind of sharing and collaborating. So it's great perspective yeah. that you have that first meeting. It's it's. Very valuable. And that's the whole thing. Like when you're working with a really talented director, you you want to support their vision, but also, you know, do what you're qualified to do. And, and from a technical standpoint, from a lighting standpoint, from, um, you know, using the camera movement to help um, tell their story better, you want to you want to support them in every possible way that you can. 
um, without trying to take ownership of the project yourself. Uh, and if you have a good working relationship, hopefully there's a synchronicity between you guys where – um, you know, you're building with one another and not working against one another. And so even establishing just like rapport with the director in advance, I know like me and the director, we went out to eat and she just wanted to hear about my life, like what was going on in my world. And I got to know her, some of her story and what was, you know, almost becoming friends in a capacity uh, I find I find to be super huge because when you're working with someone that you have no relationship with, there's a lot more walking on eggshells and a lot less confidence in the person um, and their ability. And so, just becoming uh, bu- building a relationship with that director was was you know step I don't want to say one, but it was in the early stages of you know wrapping my head around the story, building a relationship with this person, um, and then doing then then I could get to work on how I could best support that story. That's awesome. And I think also too, uh, you know, and you did this was learning the director's style, right? Because directors are totally different. You have right. very technical directors. You have directors that are more uh, just into the art with the actors. Um, you have story forward. Yeah. You yeah. have directors that have no experience. You have directors that are very experienced and can tell you exactly the right. lens they want you to use for the shot. Right. And so I think understanding the, uh, the boundaries of the relationship, like what you're talking about is really important or, or not even the boundaries, but the, uh, the, the rule book for it, right. you know, and how you're going to collaborate together. Even you and I, when we've done hundreds, if not thousands of projects together now, and, uh, you know, we, we can almost read each other's minds, yeah. right? And when it comes to cinematography, I'm like, that's Joey's decision. I can step back and let you, and, you know, I think that's that collaboration part is working it's with people. It's the trust piece, too. Yeah. And you go, I know he's got it under control. He knows what I want this scene to look like and what story elements I need to come out. And I totally trust that he's going to make it look good. And yeah. and you you give people room that to grow and to show what they can do. And, it, you know, yeah. it, it happens in, in a good way. So... Okay, so you're prepping for this. That you yep. talked about a few of the the, the preps that you did. Um, what about uh? What was there something that uh, you wish? This is kind of a fun one, but what what did you wish you prep for? Wish you mm. knew like once you got on set and looking back and go, man, I wish. Uh, and this might be revealing, but you know, what did you go? Ah, I should have studied more for that test, right? <laughs> yeah. So a couple of things on um, consistency in the type of shots that we did with multiple cameras Mm. could have been improved. And what made that shoot, what made the shoot challenging though, is there was, you know, especially in the battle scene, there was not enough time on the schedule for us to, to really be able to do what I wanted with that scene from day one. And then we had rain um, where we lost an entire day, day and a half of production while we were all on site because it was raining. Um, and so we lost time in addition to already being, you know, under the gun. Um, and there were things that I would have liked to have more consistency, um, in the prep. And there were times where we were running, running and gunning just to make our day, um, and had, my crew also, because there was a B cam operator, and I would. This is another big thing too. Now that I'm thinking about it, I I would have liked to operate less, even though I really enjoy operating with multiple cameras. Um, I would have liked to have prepped a second shooter um, to be able to execute um, operating the camera so that I could have lived on monitor because that's really where I should have been. And there was some B cam shots that could have been executed better and or or just better prepped um with that with that operator um had we had more crew and more budget so yeah and i think that's you know in another podcast we said where you're always learning or you're dead <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. and so you know you like you you learn on every project and it's like oh we're doing multiple cameras it'd be so good to have the uh, budget yeah. and the ability to put yeah i mean it's it's all part of the uh the journey in filmmaking yeah. so and it's still, uh, if you haven't seen Washington's Armor, I'm going to plug it. Go uh, take a look at Washington's Armor. You can rent it online. You can purchase it. The fight scenes, I think, are fabulous for a first-time 
DP filmmaker, and it even stands up to other feature films. It's great, man. I've seen awesome. so many B grade, C grade films uh, where the fight scenes j- it just totally falls apart, yeah. right? And so we, you know, you had a great choreographer, choreography team, stunt choreographer. Stu- yeah. Stunts was great, but your camera angles is what sold it, man. And so I, I was, I was super impressed by Thanks, the fight man. scenes. I appreciate it. I think the fight scene is definitely one of my favorite parts of that film. Um, that was something that I had never done on that caliber before. Like, I think there was 80, 75 or 80 extras in that scene. And so for a first feature, that was a pretty big undertaking. Uh, and I think that's what we actually started most of our leg of production on. I, we may have had a couple of days or something prior to that, but then we immediately dove into that, and it was it was tough. So I'm going to jump off script <clears throat> in a head here because you just mentioned something that, like, sparked – Almost this anxiety in me as a director producer. It's sometimes when people are waiting on you, right? Mm-hmm. So, what is the pressure like mm-hmm. on your first feature film when you've got eighty people and the AD and the director yeah. all looking at you, and you're trying? Maybe you're trying to buy more time to set something. Maybe you're trying to figure out a technical issue. Like, what what's the pressure yeah. like on your first feature? So, so the first, I would say, f- several days were excruciating. Um, some of my hardest days on set to this day, because even though we prepped gear and we tried to find all of the issues with the gear from the rental house, we wound up experiencing stuff like unforeseens that we could not control due to the terrain that we were in with, uh, losing signals. We were down in like this massive Valley. And the only way to get video village was to put it on the top of the Valley, Um, Like it wasn't going down just due to, you know, circumstances. And there was uh, technical issues with the wireless. So we weren't able to pull focus properly. We had rain towers that we were, you know, implementing doing day for night at the same time. Um, And there was a shortage of water uh, where there wasn't enough water. And so we had not only limited time, but we also had limited takes to get the shot. Um, and then, you know, if certain things, once the rain actually starts going and you realize, ah, oh, there's part of my foreground that's not getting water on it, this take is no good. We got to cut it. We got to reset. And, you know, there was just a ton of issues that I was running into and, and felt the weight of, you know, a hundred and something people waiting on me. And uh, it was tough. Day for night, rain, rain towers, yep. fight scenes. Yep. This is your first feature film, man. That's yeah. a, that's intense. That's yeah, a it was, lot. It was a lot for sure. So, and I I've done like a handful of like you know, fifteen people on set projects prior to this, um, but jumped all the way into the deep end with the feature, um, which was really exciting. And you're talking fifteen people, as in like cast, right? Cast and crew, yeah. like fifteen people was probably like one of the biggest projects that I had done prior to this in the commercial space and then you jump to you know closer to 130 some people on set and then technical the sky starts falling from a technical standpoint and right. so anyway the first week was really tough once we got all of the the stuff ironed out from batteries not working to villages not working and not being able to run you know hardwired stuff due to not having the length of cable for the terrain that we were in and yada 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 um, we we were we were in much better condition. I would say week two than we were week one. So, what was one of the coolest moments, like payoff moments, something that you like planned or anticipated or prepped for that you can think about in Washington's armor, where you were like, you finished filming it, and you're like, you, I'm going to shut up because I already see you. Like you already know what it is. Well, what is it? well, there's there's two moments that come to mind, but one that was really rewarding when I got the final product was some of the special effects stuff that we got to do. Mm. Um, some of the stuff that got rotoscoped and, and um, you know, CGI'd in was on a whole other level that I had never done before. And the, the team, the VFX team absolutely crushed it. And to see, um, you know, a shot that we were able to fly from a movie on top of a 30-foot jib or something like that, and and remote operate and then see the final product where they've created this entire world that didn't exist. Um, that was super cool and rewarding in the final product for sure. 
Um, but then I also remember there was one day in particular, and it was the very last um, fight scene day where we still had um, probably seven different individual stunts plus another scene um, after that, and it was lunch. We had already gone to lunch by this time. And and it was one of those things where I had to sit down with the director and be like, hey, we're not about to make our day, uh, you know, unless I jump in here and just start moving. And we made our day and got through all of the scenes, all of the fight stuff. And they came to me at the end and they were like, yo, I don't know how we just made this, but like you just made this day work and this was our last day to get the fight stuff done and we would have needed pickups if we didn't do it. And so um, that was a super rewarding day for me as well to to make it to the finish line there. Man, that's that's awesome. Any AD, producer, director is so happy to oh, yeah. make their day uh, and being that behind, that's, that's pretty epic. Yeah. So uh, we kind of talked about um, challenges on set, but... Uh, what are, can you give us like three things you've learned? Like, let's get some gold nuggets here for people that are listening that maybe are approaching their their uh, first feature film or even a short film. What would be three things you could say are the most important when they're approaching a project, um, a creative project as a DP? So I would say that the most important piece of it starts in prep. Like we talked about it already, but if you go into a project that you feel incredibly well prepared on when stuff does hit the fan and and the sky does fall on you you've already you know you've already worked through some of the stuff in your head you've already thought of backup plans you're prepared for it and even if you're not prepared for everything being in a more prepared spot is going to help you when those tough when the you know the weather starts changing and you got intermittent clouds and you got um, you know, circumstances that are outside of your control, planes coming overhead every few minutes. And now half your day is, we filmed in a, uh, there, there was a, like a, a plane airway, like right next store to this one. You know what I mean? Like there's just, there's unforeseen that, I mean, yeah, tech scout could have noted that, but maybe not that day, you know, mm. maybe, you know, there's mm-hmm. just unforeseen. Um, so the, the more prepared you are, the more your team is prepared and understands the vision of the project, your, the stylistic decisions that you you want to make for the for the piece, the better off you're going to be when you actually get to production. I always say like you know ninety percent of creating a film happens in pre pro. Um, you know most of the production is easy. That's you know the easiest part, and the edit is a even bigger piece of it than production is. But um, you know all of the work in making a film happens in in pre for me. Um, and so having, having that as your basis, you know, where you prepare and then over prepare and then over prepare your team as well. Um, that's going to be the, the best thing that you can do for the project. Um, something else that I learned that, um, (laughs) I wasn't as good at, and I still don't know if I'm, I would call myself great at, you have to be able to be. Uh, an assertive leader when there are that many people that are in the room waiting on you to make a decision and you got voices that are trying to speak up and and overshadow you and throw their creative ideas mm-hmm. in. And when people know that, hey, like you're there to do business and get work done um, and that you're assertive, it actually helps steam li- or streamline the day um, to a degree. And, and that could be a, another podcast uh, if you have to do that or not. But I think that just being a little bit more assertive in general and being more of that leader, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like you're there mm-hmm. to lead the grip team, the, you know, the gaffing team, the camera team, uh, you know, people are waiting on you to lead the technical aspects of the production. And, and if you're, if you're a pushover, it, can sometimes be difficult to to achieve. Mm. So that was another thing that I learned that I was like, man, you do kind of got to be a little bit assertive, assertive <laughs> in how you lead a film shoot. Sometimes, yeah. so those assertive, are assertive. Yeah, man, that's good. <laughs> that's uh, that's true. And I, man, I, you know, I was, I got to be on that set several times and. I saw you even growing on the set, right? Like, and I see those moments where, like, I was like, I know you 
for many years, yeah. and I, I feel like I can read your, you know, your thoughts at times, and I would see something, you know, said by another department, and I would see your wheels just spinning and being like, I'm like, oh, this is it, guys. <laughs> Joey's about to go off right now. <laughs> Smoke's about to come out, but, you you know, you handle it smoothly, yeah. and I think you were sort of, you know, you got, but uh, I think that's a great point that, you know, that grows too, right? Right. I think whatever you do, you and you, you kind of have to feel out the crowd yeah. as well. And and I'm not saying you got to be unenjoyable to work with by any means, mm. but I'm saying that people on the set have to know that your say is the final say, and that this is not a creative collaboration with all of the crew members that mm. are there. If you're not a key mm. in the production, then you know you need to be pretty minimalistic with your opinions mm. um, because that's not that's not what you're there to do. And I felt slowed down by the amount of other creative input when we initially started the feature until, you know, we had to get a couple of things together and be like, look, we are going to do it this way because I've done this and this is how it's going to go. And, you know, it's not me being rude, but, like, I think there is a certain line where a leader has to have a final say and make it known that, that's the efficient way to run the day. So. Yeah, I, and I got to share this little uh, uh, perspective of it too. And 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 I love everything about the production we did and stuff. But different companies run different productions, and and I worked on a Hulu Warner Brothers set. Yeah, and they literally create a bubble mm-hmm. around the cinematographer, the the DP, and the director, and the AD is the only one that comes in and out of that bubble, right? And on the outside, you know, and you got your keys. You got your keys sure. inside, your 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 main gaffer and stuff, right? But anybody else, production assistants, even your assistant cameras, everybody's outside of this bubble, and it's this creative energy force, and everything else on the outside is business. Yeah. We're there to make sure that this bubble doesn't get broken, and so there is less noise in the room at times uh, right. for that creativity to be really honed and focused in. And you know it, it depends because yeah some some sets are more collaborative and some but you're right you know at the end of the day somebody's got to make a decision and the buck stops with you on the creative visuals and the technical side of yeah. how it looks alongside the the director yeah. so that's great man um, so if somebody's listening and like what do you suggest to uh, uh, for somebody in the industry trying to get on a feature film right. Mm. Right? What's the path? Like, would you suggest? Uh, h- how do you get on a feature film? It's a good question. Um, so I would say there's a couple of different things. One, everyone's path doesn't look the same. Um, you know, there's there's a hundred different roads that lead to the same destination um, of the feature film space, and you know, you can ask a lot of people, and a lot of people's answers are different. You know, I haven't I haven't actually heard anyone who had the same answer that I had, mm. and so I you know I got. I got somewhat lucky with mine just being in the right place at the right time and and the right preparation, you know, coming before the opportunity and, you know, certain things happening. But that's not something that you prepare to go that route on. It kind of happened and and fell in my lap. That being said, um, I think there's a lot of value, one, um, of doing commercial work in advance to feel comfortable and confident enough running. Like, you need to be able to confidently and comfortably run a commercial set before you dive into doing a narrative project, especially on a bigger scale. Um, you know, and, and again, I'm not talking about like the, you know, self-funded, I made a feature for five grand. I'm talking about the stuff where, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars are riding on this. And, you know, it's, it, it, those are the type of projects that I'm talking about. But if you have prepared for on a commercial set, um, you get to experience so many different lighting scenarios, so many different ways to tell a story with a camera um, that I think commercial films really help prepare people to be uh, in the feature space. Um, the other thing that I would add to that is you got to be willing to be the lowest dog on a feature film set to start meeting and networking with people who make feature narrative films. Um, so if you're constantly... Uh, you know, working, or I don't even want to say constantly, if you get an opportunity to be a PA on a feature film set, there's there's an extraordinary amount of value in doing that to be able to network with 
producers, directors, the DP, um, other key department roles who you get to buddy up with and become friends with. And they follow you on social media and they see that, oh, you do really great work. And then this project comes along three months later and then you get the call because you're, you might be more available or more reachable and, you know, you get to slowly climb your way up. I wound up, um, finding a guy on social. I, 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 this is a quick story on, how I made it to my first Netflix set. And I, I wasn't a DP or anything for it, but at the time it was a really big deal. Um, but I hit, I was driving through uh, the state of Arizona and one of my favorite director DPs lives there and I shot him a DM and was like, hey, you know, I'm passing through. I'll be here for the next, you know, couple of days. Uh, if you need any extra hands on set, let me know. I'd be happy to help whatever your production, you know, blah, blah, blah. He says, hey, can you be here tomorrow? And I said, yeah, and it winds up being a Netflix production, uh, and I got to PA with one of my favorite, you know, DPs of all time, um, because I simply just asked to help out, and I volunteered time, and I get a call the next day after we'd already, you know, worked together for a day, uh, and he said, hey, do you shoot BTS? And I was like, yes. And so again, I was in the right place at the right time, and. Uh, you know, wound up, wound up getting an opportunity to work on a Netflix production and met directors from that, um, or, or, or I'm sorry, met the producers from that. That got me on an additional paid Netflix set uh, a year after that. And so literally two different, um, just from networking with the right people, I got on two different like Netflix production uh, films again, smaller roles, but got to meet people to wind up getting on more of those different productions. And so, you know, being willing to take those smaller jobs, volunteer your time, networking is huge, uh, and then just you know making sure that from co commercial work that your talent is ready um, and, and and you're qualified to do the job. Man, those are some great nuggets of knowledge and wisdom from our man Joey Nicotra over there. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to hear a little bit about the future, man. What would be your dream project, genre, feature film type? Definitely action. I'm, I really want to go hard on the, the action film space, and I want to blow buildings up and cars up and flip you know, trucks and do the car chases and all of that stuff. I haven't had an opportunity to do that. Um, and so we, we, I did get to do a, a battle scene um, and there was, you know, gunfire and stuff like that, but I haven't got to do, it was 1700s battle. Um, and so I would really love to do some, some action uh, shoot 'em up movies for sure down the future. Nice. Nice. I can't wait to watch that man. Yeah. Well, Thanks for sharing your story. I hope people have found some yeah. gold in that and can apply it to their filmmaking journey of uh, leveling up their game and getting to that DP seat, if that's the uh, vision and the goal of their journey. Keep on shooting, man. Keep on making that great content. I can't wait Thank to you, watch this action film. That Down the road. Planning to do. Someday. Yeah. Appreciate awesome. it, brother.